Health Hangout on Childhood Obesity. My name's Vanessa Hattersley, I'm a registered dietitian and founder of the Health Hangout. Um, and tonight I'm joined uh, with two brilliant experts. I'll let them introduce themselves in a second. I should say before I forget that I'm in Melbourne, so it's night time here. Um, but I'll pass it over to Paul, he's in the UK. Paul, do you want to say a little bit about yourself? So good morning from the UK. Uh, my name's Paul Gately, I'm Professor of Exercise and Obesity at Leeds Metropolitan University. And I'm also the director of More Life, which is a weight management organisation for adults and children and young people. Fantastic. What's the weather like there, Paul? I wouldn't be British if I didn't ask. It's it's a tad grey, but uh, we set. To, it's been quite warm. We've had a nice heat wave. Unusually warm for the UK. <laughs> Very good. Okay, and um, uh, on, over on this side of the world with me, we've got uh, Karen Campbell. Karen, uh, how are you? Can you introduce yourself? Um, I'm good, but it's a tad black here, <laughs> rather than a tad grey. Um, so I'm Karen Campbell, I'm an Associate Professor in the School of Exercise and Nutrition Sciences at Deakin University, and um, yeah, my, my area of interest is obesity prevention in kids, the focus on families and pregnant women. Brilliant. So welcome to our panel of experts for this evening or the, the, in the morning, wherever you are in the world watching us. Um, mm. If you are watching us live, you can uh, get involved if you're on Twitter. If you use the hashtag HealthHO, you can join the conversation. If you've got any um, questions for our experts or any comments, we keep an eye on Twitter whilst we're doing the Hangout. So um, I can feed those through to Paul and Karen. And hopefully if we don't talk for too long, we'll be able to squeeze some of those questions and comments in at the end. Um, but let's get um, cracking. Um, uh, so we're here today to talk about childhood obesity. Um, I thought it was a really good subject to cover because the last hangout we did was on early life programming and how your diet when you're um, pregnant and a, and a baby's uh, infant feeding, how that affects their health for the rest of their lives. So I thought it was quite nice linked to talk about childhood obesity. Um, it's great that we've got experts from the UK and Australia, so it would be good to hear, I think, about the different experiences. And um, I guess let's start with understanding a, a, about the, the picture, really, and, and just how serious is um, childhood obesity for the UK and for Australia. So um, let's go for Paul first. I feel like um, you know, <laughs> like I'm in the generation game or something, <laughs> like handing over to the contestants. <laughs> So um, yeah, Paul, tell us what it what it's all like there in the UK with childhood obesity. So we're really lucky in the UK because we have the National Children's Weight and Measuring Programme. So all children aged 5 and age 11 are assessed for their weight every year. Um, so And we have great data and we have that year on year data. So at the moment we have about 23% of our boys aged 5 and 21% of our girls aged 5 are overweight or obese and that number then jumps up uh, for 11 year old boys to about 35 percent and 11 year old girls to 32 percent so broadly speaking when we take the whole children and young people population we're probably looking at a round figure of about one in three of children in in any given classroom would be overweight or obese in the UK Paul, can I just ask you that the figure you know between overweight and obesity when you're saying 31 32 percent so in in the in um, eleven year olds, about twenty percent of that thirty odd percent would be obese, um, and so much smaller percentage of overweight. So what we're seeing is that kids drift through the overweight category into the obese category quite quickly. Um, in the in the early years, um, it's about uh, ten percent obesity. So it doubles in that period of time. And the overweight levels between 5 and 11 pretty much stay the same at around 13, 14 percent. Very interesting. Wow. How does that compare to Australia then, Karen? Well, interesting that the, interestingly, the figures appear to be much higher, although the real, reality here in Australia is that we don't measure as often. So our most recent data on childhood overweight and obesity certainly shows dramatic increases over the last 30 years and persistent increases. Um, but our data, last data was 2007. Um, and in fact, while I say persistent increases, in fact, in the previous 10 years, it looked like we probably plateaued. So overall, we have about 25, 26% of children aged between 5 and 17 are overweight and obese. 
Um, as I said, that's plateaued in the last 10 years, but what's been interesting is that when we look at figures for boys, boys overweight, sorry, boys overweight remained pretty similar, but their figures for obesity doubled from 4 to 8% um, in those previous 10 years, between 1995 and 2007. Um, girls' figures for obesity stayed pretty stable at about 6%. But girls um, in that kind of really important time before they're heading up towards childbearing years, so between about 15 and, and 17, uh, their rates of overweight went from about 12% to 20%. So it's a, you know, incredibly important to understand those times of transition if you're looking for opportunities for prevention. Wow, okay. Um, I guess another, yeah. just another important add-on, sorry Vanessa to interrupt, is just to highlight that we do have data on younger children and, and that of course is my focus. Um, and my interest in overweight, um, in obesity prevention is really very stimulated by the fact that by the age of um, four in Australia, about 20% of children are already overweight or obese. And I think that, that those, those, there are actually similar trends because that's similar in the UK for four-year-olds. Um, mm. And interestingly, in the teenage years, we've been involved in a, in a study of about 30,000 kids in, in the Leeds area. So it is, this is only Leeds and not the UK as a whole. But we, what we're seeing in a trend is that boys are, their BMI is not necessarily increasing that much. Their waist circumference is increasing slightly. But in girls, over that sort of period from 11 to 17, we are seeing an increase in BMI, but we're seeing a significant increase in waist circumference. So mm -hmm. now, is waist circumference the right measure or not is a, good, is a good question, but I think at the end of the day, it shows that there are differences in genders, and we really need to start to consider that when we move okay. forward. Well, um, one thing I wanted to understand is um, about people's um, awareness of overweight and obese, um, obesity, because I was doing some work the other day looking at um, people's uh, own personal um, awareness of, of their weight and whether they considered themselves to be a healthy weight, overweight. Um, and the, the levels just didn't really match up in terms of a lot more people felt very comfortable that they were at a healthy weight um, when you actually compare them to the, those to the stats of the numbers of people that are overweight and obese. Um, and I wonder if that's something to do with social norms and as the population gets heavier it becomes more normal and I'd just be quite interested to understand, I guess with children, are parents recognising that their children are um, overweight or, or obese and so perhaps Paul could you comment on that from your experience? So yeah I mean th there is actually reasonable evidence on this and um, there was a paper published in the British Medical Journal in 2005 which which outlined that about 75 percent of parents of overweight children would underestimate the weight of their child and about 50 percent of parents with obese children would underestimate the weight of their child with 30% of parents with an obese child would identify their child as just right. So just what you've described is, is the reality of a, of a misperception. We did a study uh, with a whole group of healthcare professionals, pediatricians, dietitians, nurses, doctors, uh, and a real broad range of, uh, of excellent healthcare professionals in the local area in Yorkshire. We found almost identical figures that those healthcare professionals, 75% of them underestimated the weight of an overweight child and 50% underestimated the weight of an obese child. So there is clear issue around that sort of misperception. Just out of interest, Paul, as a healthcare professional, did you cut that data by the, the, the type of healthcare professional you were looking at at all? Like, did you dig down to see if that was, I'm just trying to understand if as a no. dietetic profession we were... You know. <laughs> it's a great question. We, we, what we expected was uh, we were surprised because we found very consistent views across all those professionals because what was interesting, we expected to see the more clinical uh, professionals, the sort of pediatricians and, and the doctors that would look at the hardcore data and make a decision. And actually they were just as, they were less likely to define it. And when we interviewed those professionals, a lot of them were saying they just felt uncomfortable uh, categorizing children in this way, so they could they knew the date what the data said, but their their inability to therefore define and agree with those categories 
was a challenge. And I think that is a fundamental problem. And you know, and I think what we continue to do is question some of the methods we use, whether be it BMI, be it waist circumference, and they're not perfect. We know they're not perfect, but it, but we have to have some sort of indicator. It would be my view that we can use, um, and so we would argue BMI and waste is appropriate um, to help us categorise children. And then what you do about it is another matter. Yeah, Karen, do you have any thoughts on that? Obviously, um, this is a very sensitive area. Then, and the message coming from Paul there is that not just parents, but healthcare professionals themselves. To, you know, don't feel entirely comfortable to broach to broach this as an area. And obviously, having just talked about all the stats that we've got there, that is, you know, a real disconnect there. And um, I mean, Karen, can you talk a little bit about um, your experience because you you work more in the early years, and so perhaps you've got some comments yeah. on that. Actually, Paul's uh, comments prompted me to think about a study that's being conducted by, by one of my friends and colleagues, Elizabeth Danny Wilson. Um, and I'm working with Elizabeth at the moment to design trials um, focused in primary care. So I guess acknowledging that people like practice nurses and maternal and child health nurses are really uh, have enormous access to children and are a great um, a great place for starting discussions around healthy eating and active play and, and I guess identifying children at risk. And in a pilot study that Elizabeth ran she, with practice nurses, and she's a nurse herself, so she's very well accepted, she was talking to, about the, to these nurses about the prevalence of overweight or obesity in the, the children they see. And these nurses were responsible for conducting universal health checks in their practice, the four-year-old health check. and they were really interested to hear what she had to say, but they were adamant that overweight and obesity wasn't a problem in their practice. So they then went forward and started to weigh and measure and plot um, and graph the children's weights, or their BMIs. And in fact, the prevalence was the same as the rest of the world, or the rest of Australia, so it was about 25%. And, and the nurses were astonished. And, and, they, and to their great credit, they could, could see how it was that they, social norms, as you pointed out, um, have led us to believe that a healthy body weight looks different to what BMI would tell us. So, you know, very, 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 very complex, I think, to assess what, what is a healthy weight when you look at someone if all the children around you um, are, you know, what will one in, in four, or in Paul's case, one in three, are actually um, pretty heavy. I mean, who, who are the light children in those scenarios? Absolutely. I think there's, there's a really important point about the social norming because um, I think over the last decade, we, particularly in the UK, and it'd be great to get uh, a view from Karen about Australia, but a lot of the TV programs that are focused on obesity are focused on very extreme obesity. Mm. And so what becomes the social norm of obesity is you know, very vulnerable um, people with serious weight problems, you know, BMI mm. 50 plus. And so the, the, the generic population watching these TV programs, that becomes serious obesity to, the, to them when actually they're, they're hugely high on the, on the BMI scale um, as professionals and there's a huge number of people in, in, the, in the area before that. And I think that is a fundamental problem about, you know, so it's a fundamental challenge for parents, for adults, for anybody who wants to consider weight as an issue because the social norms are so well, um, are so poorly communicated to people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Again, you remind me of uh, an interesting discussion I, I had um, with someone who runs one of our football clubs, and this is Australian rules football, not soccer, uh, and she was telling me that they'd had a, a video from 1960, which was a football fun day, so all the kids came along to the football ground and the footballers were playing with them, and it was a hot day, so the kids were running around without their tops on. So this is 1960, and in 1960 in Australia, 5% of children were overweight or obese. She said, they were playing it to the board because it was going to be some promotional material to the board of the football club. And the film started to play and they were looking at these kids and there was this palpable silence through the room. And they realised that they were incredibly uncomfortable because they were looking at children from Biafra. These, were, these children were malnourished, you could see their ribs, um, but in fact they were normal white kids. And, and I found that story really, really interesting because we w I know with my own children, if I can see their ribs, I start to worry that they're not getting enough to eat. And, and when you think about 
how we're hinged around the need for food, the need for growth, um, the need to avoid starvation. Parents do push to get kids heavier and, and we know from our research that the primary anxiety for parents of very young children is that they're not getting enough to eat. And of course this leads to the promotion of um, what we consider unhelpful behaviours like pushing children to finish what's on their plate, overriding their very wonderful innate capacities of appetite regulation. Um, and it, and it, it all relates to this same issue that we're just not comfortable if you can see the bones sticking through the flesh. Well, Karen, I might just bring in a question there that we have from um, a dietitian. Um, I'll just read it out, actually, it's quite long. She says, uh, her name's Kathy. She says, hi, I've got a question to ask the panel. I'm interested as an, in an expert's opinion on how we as a society can influence and support the culinary aspects of getting families and kids more involved in basic food selection and cooking. I'm also interested in how mealtime behaviours can positively influence health outcomes. As an anecdote of my own family, I have four kids and basically cook most nights, catering for, uh, for six mouths to feed our family. Unlike my own family mealtime upbringing, I have tended to serve a buffet-style meal rather than plated up individual meals. I have theorised that this style of service has helped train all my kids to monitor their own hunger by selecting as little or as much on their plate. I also feel this has, an empowerment, has empowered them to taste, explore and widen their food repertoire. I'd be interested in your view of simply changing meal service behaviours and how this could be an effective strategy. So I think, I don't know, that question, I just links quite nicely to what you were just saying then Karen about meal times. Yeah, so that, that there's actually a lot of really important points that have been raised in there. Um, and so just to perhaps pick up on the last one about um, mealtime strategies, I, I think it's an incredibly, I, I mean, I, I just, before I say this, I think it's really important to acknowledge that parents are nested within broader communities that often subvert fantastic things that are happening in the family environment. And we, we mustn't forget that and, and agitate for change at that level. So, for example, um, if you go to school and the food that's provided at school um, is not consistent with the healthy stuff that's happening at home, then that's a missed opportunity. But um, in the home environment, parents uh, very traditionally are encouraging kids to eat more. They're pushing very young children, even you know babies who are being formula fed, they're being pushed to finish what's in the bottle as opposed to allowing a child to stop and regulate when they've had enough. One of the great advantages of breastfeeding is you've got no idea how much they've had to eat. It's not your call, it's the baby's call. Um, I like the idea also of a buffet style of eating um, with families because it, if, you, if you take the philosophy that the food that's provided is healthy and one food would be as good as another, you provide a child with the opportunity to regulate their intake as opposed to a mother deciding how much to put on a plate. And when we've asked parents how much do you put on a plate for your two-year-old, they say, well, quite a lot because I, I don't want them to be hungry. The problem with that is that if the child doesn't finish what's on the plate, they feel a compulsion to keep pushing them to eat. And of course, children don't need all that much food. So, you know, I think there's probably some merit in um, a buffet-style approach. I think there's a lot of merit in eating together and in families and, and not, not undervaluing the importance of parental modelling. And, and we all know that's important around really topical issues like uh, smoking and violence and um, treating people well. We know that children copy parental behaviours. Well, they also copy uh, behaviours around liking food, um, eating a balanced meal, spending time at the table in a conversational setting. So uh, there's a lot that we could talk with. We could run a whole health hangout on, on that topic, but um, I'm conscious of not raving on too long. <laughs> um, but I think that's, uh, that's really nice, Karen. I think um, maybe then um, we could go to Paul and, and because I guess that must be some of the, the sort of stuff and the work that you're doing with the, the More Life program. So it would be great just to hear a little bit about that um, for those that aren't familiar with it. So More Life is a, is a, is a effectively as a, originated as a research uh, component of, of the university where we were really trying to do a couple of things um, from a research perspective. One was to understand the key ingredients of successful weight loss management. But more importantly in our latter years we've seen lots of expertise and lots of people doing some great research around those key ingredients. So we're in a very fortunate position, it's great researchers and academics and people like Karen who are doing some really good leading research 
that allows us to start to put these things into practice. And so, you know, a lot of the evidence base, you know, shows consistent outcomes around some of the generic behavior changes that we're trying to adopt, dietary, positive dietary change, physical activity change. But the translation of that knowledge into practice is where the evidence base is quite clear there are huge gaps. So we've really spent the last four or five years trying to establish the operational systems in order to deliver interventions at a greater scale. And we're still, you know, we're still only a small scale working with about three and a half thousand children per year. In in comparison to the large number of overweight and obese children in the UK, I mean we have about four and a half million overweight and obese kids within the UK. In terms of what we what have we done, I suppose um, just looking back to my own childhood, I was I was an athlete and and I remember as an athlete having lots of opportunities. So there were summer camp programs, there were after school clubs, there were weekend programs. So when, I was very fortunate that there was a whole raft of menu options for me. And as we started to think about where could we intervene, and a lot of work in the UK has been going around the school environment. So we started to look outside the school environment, where could we intervene? And so we developed some residential treatment programs that predominantly run over the summer and the Easter period. We de we've developed day camp programs so af uh, during the holiday period throughout the year, and then after school and weekend clubs. So we've really taken that philosophy of sport and leisure and said, how can we provide the same opportunities for obese children and young people? And, and really that's what we've done. We've got four different types of interventions from the residential to a, a, a sort of what we define as a tier three, that's an MDT service with dietitians, psychologists, doctors, um, providing the expert care where necessary. Then we have the community programs, 12 weeks, after school or weekend. And then we have a web-based service where we support children and young people with online games and activities and monitoring of their behaviors. And so what it gives us is two things. It gives us access points for different levels of needs. So if you've got a severely obese child, they probably need much longer term intervention. So we would see obesity as a long term condition. So we provide them with the residential program that and fits into a more sort of multidisciplinary service, into more community and web. And so we're supporting severely obese children for over a year in terms of intervention. But then for children that have just got a few pounds that they just need to consider and maybe change the lifestyle or become more physically active or modify their diet ever so slightly, then the community program fits for them. So easy access, it's not intensive, it's not as expensive either. So we can consider the health care costs as well as we consider the impacts and the need. And, and really that's about transitioning those children and young people. Uh, into other activities, be it sport, be it leisure, be it cooking, be it drama. We're just trying to give them the, the key skills so that they can engage uh, in many other activities that are available to them as children and young people. Cool. And so, um, and, you know, how, how does that compare to you then, Karen? Because obviously Paul's area of focus is, a, is, a, is an older age group, really, and um, yours is a younger focus, isn't it? Yeah, so a, a younger focus, and I, I don't work in treatment. We work in, um, I guess, opportunities for prevention. So very important side-by-side um, -side activities, I, I would argue, because we, we've got to see these things in combination. So I, the work that the research that I've um, led in the last, uh, I guess, five or six years has been very much focused on um, accessing women at a time or accessing families at a time of high transition, and in fact. Very high, self, uh, very high health service use and very high levels of interest and motivation. Um, so we're, we're working with mums of new babies, so first time mums actually. So uh, we know that first time mums in Australia access health services 35 times on average in the first year of life. So that includes pharmacists, maternal and child health nurses, GPs. And we know that these, these um, accesses are not to, to, to talk about what's gone wrong in their health but it's about what to do to have good health so they're about promoting health so we kind of plugged into this um, high levels of interest a nice period of transition and we've used what we call our first-time parent groups which is set up by the wonderful maternal and child health nurses that provide a universal service to our first-time parents and we basically have plugged into uh, what we know happens they form social groups, women like to get together and talk about their babies 
And we know in, this, in Victoria that about 70% of all parents join these groups and they last on average for about 18 months. So we designed a randomised control trial where in our intervention group we basically plugged into these first time parent groups, these nice social networks and said can we come along once every three months and talk to you about healthy eating and active play for your baby and 90% of parents said yes which is an astonishingly high recruitment success rate and we just went along and talked in a very anticipatory way about what was going to happen next around food and play and to get them to talk about what they might do about that and we had key messages of course. Their opportunity for them was to talk about whether they thought that would work and after the event whether things did work, what strategies were useful, what weren't and so there's a lot of uh, group-led parent, uh, group problem solving. Um, so we ran that program over about 18 months, we saw them six times and we've seen some really nice changes in health behaviours in the mums, not so much in the dads but some really nice changes in attitudes and beliefs in parents and some modest um, but important changes we think in children's the young children's diet and physical activity behaviour, sorry, sedentary behaviours as well. Um, that's a program of work that's been started all over again with the World Cancer Research Fund funded program and it runs not just for 18 months but the intervention runs over three years so I guess capturing what we know is a very challenging time for parents when they have toddlers and we're actually just designing the film clips that will inform that the web based delivery of that intervention because first time mums groups start to fall apart because we know everyone goes back to work and or many people go back to work. So we're going to use Facebook and text and, and web based um, sort of vignettes and skills based stuff to help inform parents what to do around parenting to get healthy eating and active play enmeshed and tra good trajectories of those behaviours happening over time. I also do quite a lot of work in the pregnancy space, um, but we'll see if we've got time to talk about that as we go on. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, I, I think we do want to hear about that, Karen, but I just, I thought it was quite interesting that you mentioned web-based stuff because that was something that Paul, you mentioned as well, and I thought it would be, maybe, could you tell us a little bit more about the, the web stuff that you do, Paul, and how that works? So there's a, there's a, I mean, it's really interesting listening to Karen because obviously, um, as I alluded to, part of our work has been around the key ingredients and we our programs actually don't start until age five and because we didn't feel we understood the key ingredients enough and in a sense that's where this sort of complementary workers and we've positioned ourselves in the translation into sort of practice at a scale and so that's why it, it's great to have experts and, and really good scientists like Karen and others that can help us understand those key ingredients such that you know I would sort of consider myself not as a scientist but more as a sort of practitioner um, in putting that into practice on a, on a large scale so it's really complementary and and I think over time we'll we'll begin to look at that early five pre five because we recognize it's critical but we we just weren't confident enough in 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 our own knowledge or the evidence base to make that transition so it's great that there are there are experts out there they're designing that I think in terms of the web-based side, we there's there is there is clear value of, of web and there is clear engagement in, in web-based activities with children and people. And so we've been spending a, a long time on trying to understand what are the sort of key mechanisms. And and to be honest, we you know rather than we've evolved rather than revolutionised this sort of space. So we take on board a lot of the sort of social media things that people use and social networking tools. So from status updates to sharing pictures to sharing stories and forums but then there's also an element by which we have a behavior change component and the behavior change component is built around what we know as key behavior change components in terms of goal setting monitoring problem solving a whole range of activities there um, in it in then addition to that um, the information that that people are often looking for the sort of evidence-based information that parents or children and people are looking for are there. So we, we've got a mixture of that sort of social networking, that behavior change, and um, and um, the the ability to access information and good quality information as well. And I think that's a critical piece because there is a lot of information out there, but it's really difficult for parents to to cut through what is the latest diet they've read in the magazine, what's the latest new fay 
uh, that fad that's out there. And so making sure they've got a place to go and also a place to communicate as well has been, has been really critical in that web-based space. Um, we haven't got it right. We're still working on it. We've, interestingly, we've, we've in the last year, I have a role at Imperial College in London. There's expertise there on virtual worlds. So we've been, we've been playing around in the virtual world space. But what was really interesting was that they didn't want the games that went with the, the virtual world dimension. What they wanted was good old-fashioned chatting. And so where we're translating to is almost like the health hangout, where people can have conversations face-to-face. -face. They're in a virtual way rather than face-to-face -face in an environment which is more expensive, but more cost-effective and more conducive to people's lives as well, so they can get online, get access to information at the times that's right for them fitting that into their busy life. So it just becomes an added component of the, all, of the overall intervention portfolio. Yeah, exactly, and that's why we're here with our health hangout, with our, uh, you know, credible experts, and um, I was reading something the other day and some stats, and I'm sure it was around, um, you know, in terms of where do people get their health information and also how much do they trust it, and I'm sure it was around sort of 60-70% of people get their health information now from Dr. Google, and you know, are quite confident, they feel quite confident in being able to sift through that and find information that they believe to be, um, credible and trustworthy, which um, raised my eyebrows <laughs> a little bit. So, um, but that's really interesting, I think, about the web-based stuff and sort of moving along uh, with technology and how people's lives are changing. So, um, so it sounds then like uh, Paul needs to pay for Karen to come over to the UK, so Paul can <laughs> Karen can implement all her stuff there in the early years, and then by next year, um, brilliant. Karen, just, I think it would be nice actually to hear a little bit about um, your experience of pregnancy, uh, not your personal experience of pregnancy, but um, oh. in, that, in that setting. Um, I think, I mean we've run over slightly, but I'm sure people are finding it interesting so they won't mind. Well look, um, I, I sort of, my research obviously has been with mums with young children and the more I read um, and I guess we, we've been in the position in the last five years where we've, we've had some really big epidemiological studies, um, including the Millennium Study in the UK, that have really highlighted that risk factors for child aid are positive at age three uh, relate very much to maternal weight before pregnancy, paternal weight also before um, the pregnancy of their wives or their partners, and the amount of weight gain during pregnancy. And so I've become really interested in that space. Um, I guess primarily because it seems to me a really keen opportunity for prevention and I'm interested in translatable interventions and I'm interested in the biggest bang for buck and of course it's a bit of a two for one offer if you're working with pregnant women because you have the opportunity to influence the outcome for a child, the unborn child, but you also have the really important opportunity to influence the woman's trajectory for overweight and obesity across her childbearing years and, and of course you know the, the biggest killer for women in their 40s and 50s and beyond is breast cancer is um, cardiovascular disease and that's strongly related to this um, period of high weight gain across childbearing years. So I just see it as a really nice place to be working, um, some really good synergies and, and of course the messages that you're promoting around um, promoting a healthy diet, promoting high engagement and physical activity, lim limiting sedentary behaviours, if you're focusing on pregnant women, are all messages that we've been focusing on um, the parent as a role model when they have their children. So there's just this really nice continuity of messaging. Um, and look, in that space, we've actually, one of my PhD students, Jane Wilcox, has just finished a study with about 380 pregnant women looking at their information sources. And as you say, the web is increasingly um, an important source for their uh, access of information around um, a healthy pregnancy. Very few of them get any advice about how much weight to gain in pregnancy and we know in Australia that 50% of women are overweight or obese when they get pregnant and most women are gaining more than the recommendations uh, for weight during pregnancy which of course is a risk factor for child adiposity. So there's lots of room um, to provide support and she's in the throes of um, seeking funding to well together we're trying to do that to design a mobile phone based intervention um, where we'll be pushing messages to pregnant women around achieving uh, healthy eating and active um, physical activity uh, guidelines. So that's a really um, 
innovative piece of research, I think, with some really uh, important opportunities as time goes on. I've got another student, Paige van der Kleid, who's been working with women in the, the interpartum. One of the challenges of working with pregnant women is um, that you, you need to get in touch with them really early. You need to be working with them probably before five weeks, six weeks of pregnancy because weight gain is very rapid in those first three months for many women. Um, Half of women don't know, don't plan to get pregnant, which is, surprises me somewhat. So it's a little bit hard to, to access that group. So we decided that given that most women who have one baby will go on and have another baby, at least one more, uh, the interpartum phase is really important. And in fact, um, we've just looked at looking at our data today and in our, our cohort of, you know, a nice representative sample of Victorian women, the average, um, postpartum weight retention, you know, so three months after they had their baby was about five kilos. So, the, and they'd moved two BMI points up from where they were before they had their, their first child. So you can see that there's this pattern of increasing weight gain. So Paige has been working on a, um, using a free web-based healthy lifestyle intervention uh, and, and a bit of dietitian input. Um, so a very low cost, potentially broad reach approach to helping women um, get back to their pre-pregnancy weight before they hit their second pregnancy. So better outcomes hopefully for them and better outcomes for their subsequent children. Karen, I don't know um, if you saw, but um, there was quite an outrage um, yesterday on Twitter with um, Catherine obviously having her baby, I should probably call her by an official name if we're streaming live on the internet. But, um, <laughs> and um, on OK Magazine there was a photo of her um, and uh, talking about her, you know, post-baby weight loss regime and her trainers giving her all her, all his or her, I don't know, insider secrets on how quickly she should lose the, the weight and then, you know, total outrage at that as well and rightly so because she's only just had the baby, you know, <laughs> she's not yeah. going to be thinking about things like that. But I guess because we talked about um, uh, weight being a, a sensitive issue in children, I guess my sense is as well that in pregnancy, again, that's, that's um, as, a, as a woman, it's quite a vulnerable time for you and you're getting lots of information from all sides as well and I can imagine that, um, you know, most pregnant women will be um, aware of their weight and concerned or, you know, have, have concerns or questions perhaps about that and I just wondered if you had any thoughts about, again, that being another sort of, how do you handle that in a sensitive way, I guess, as a healthcare professional is my question. Mm. It's, it's a really um, important point that you raise and in fact in a study that um, Jane Wilcox, my, um, who's now a PhD student, in her um, honours year she actually looked at what uh, what midwives who are the people who have the uh, most contact with pregnant women in Australia, um, she was interested to see what midwives thought about weight whether they mentioned weight and how they engaged around weight. And interestingly, midwives did see themselves as the primary source of lifestyle information. So they see themselves as a very important role there. But they wouldn't raise weight as an issue because they thought it might hurt women's um, self-esteem. And, uh, you know, I, I both understand that and rail against that because I, I think if we put that in the context of opportunities for their own health and their baby's health then and they understood what those risks were uh, there's other other issues to consider and I and notwithstanding that I agree with you women are sensitive about their body image they're sensitive also though about providing the best for their children which is a primary concern and I, I think you know we, we've touched I think Paul touched on healthcare practitioner training we just have enormous enormous room for movement around training people to be sensitive in their discussions about weight, about focusing on um, positive health outcomes and focusing on achievable changes to diet and physical activity. There's just enormous room to move there and um, a lot of a lot for us to learn about how to do that uh, and I, I feel Paul could add a lot to this discussion right now, having had five or six or twelve children himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't have those children myself. Actually, my wife had them. So, uh, that, that's where all the credit is due. I'm sure. You, I'm sure you were intimately involved. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I suffered too during those vulnerable periods. Uh, it has to be said. Um, I must say, my husband gained as much weight as I did. <laughs> 
Um, no, I mean, it is a really critical period. And, and again, I think, for, for me, the, there is a lot to learn. There's a lot about the language, about the tone, about how do we communicate effectively? How do we positively, you know, create um, uh, an, an environment such that, you know, mums don't feel that way, that they actually sit as just a matter of course as they get to the sort of feeding and changing and helping the development of their child, they see that that's part of their own their own health and well-being, but part of their critical part of their family's health and well-being. And I think, you know, I think it's it's often seen as an either or that only celebrities or certain people can get. When actually there's a there's you know it is it is an absolute critical element for all, but we don't necessarily frame it in that way. And I think you know what was very well received was was Kate's walking out of the the hospital and how she didn't hide her shape at that point and you know I, I saw a lot of dialogue about how positive that was and how real it was and how, how how normal and natural it was and I think that's where we need to be normal and natural not celebrities one end and then normal the other end and I think um, or the generic population I think you know that they're the great messages and you know and yes um, the, the Duchess of Cambridge will have to work very hard uh, as any m new mum would have to work hard to to maintain a healthy lifestyle in the challenge of sleepless nights and you know all that comes with being a new mum and we don't want to overburden them but we want to be able to fit that critical element of health and well-being into into that sort of post-pregnancy period. Yeah, I think nicely said and I, and I think you know with my, my prevention hat on I guess I just look at these as opportunities where you can shift the trajectory. So if the average weight gain in our sample of 450 women was four and a half kilos, if you could actually make that two kilos, you, you will make a substantial difference to weight trajectories over time. So it's not about being a perfect figure, having a perfect figure at the end of your pregnancy, it's about reducing risk. and and. You know, we know in the Australian context that very few women have are, are advised as to how much they, weight they should gain, and we during their pregnancy. And we also know that knowing how much weight to gain, which is determined by um, your your BMI before you got pregnant, knowing having guidance on how much weight to gain does affect how much weight you gain. So these things are achievable. And I guess if you if you're functioning in a void at a time of incredibly rapid physiological physiological change, you kind of say, oh, well, this must be how it happens. Um, however, if you're told that look, a good weight range for you is between X and Y, then you've got some parameters to move by. And, and if you've got a good healthcare provider, they will also explain to you that those figures are means with, with important standard deviations and, and be able to pro provide some guidance about where you might sit in the normal population. Yeah. I, was I, was just gonna gonna say, I think it is difficult. I mean, you know, as I've alluded, as we've said, I've got lots of children. Um, so <laughs> our, our fifth arrives in uh, September. But but what's interesting, my wife really struggled with the physical activity dimension because she wanted to go to the gym and be active, but she was constantly bombarded by the fitness instructors at this particular gym, which is a national chain in the UK that kept saying, well, you know, it's you're a health and safety <laughs> risk. Despite the fact she'd been going there regularly, and you know there were no contraindications that 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 she shouldn't do that, but that, that's the generic attitude around pregnancy, and I think those are big issues we have to grapple with and change as well. Karen, I was just going to ask, and I think we should probably finish off now. Now, otherwise, we'll take everyone's day up. But I was just going to ask actually about the, the the weight guidelines in pregnancy, because in the UK we don't have any um, clear uh, weight guidelines in pregnancy. The only ones I'm familiar with are the um, Institute of Medicine ones from uh, the US, and I just and I know NICE have looked at it in the UK. Um, can correct me if I'm wrong, Paul. But do do we have them in Australia? Do we have um, you know NICE? mean guidelines of, you know, if you start at this BMI then this is the expectation of what would be a, an appropriate amount of weight gain. Do we have that in Australia? So, no, we don't have our own guidelines and we tend to lean on the um, IOM, so the International um, Institutes of Medicine from the US. And But that's a very recent thing. Weight, weight has not been um, part of policy around pregnancy at all and uh, it was only in March this year that the Australian the Australian College for 
obstetrics and gynaecology actually released a position statement around healthy weight gain in pregnancy. So this is actually a, 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 as fundamental as this seems to me. This is actually a very new space and it's it's kind of politically been an interesting space because it's, it's followed on the very topic that we uh, have raised. Uh, which is concerns about women's body images and and midwives are an incredibly uh, intelligent and powerful professional group and as they should be um, but there was a strong movement um, sort of post feminism in the 70s that said it's not appropriate to weigh, weigh women what we understood in a, a lighter society was that weighing women was all about um, making sure that their blood pressures weren't getting too high and there was evidence that that made no difference at all and so it was dropped and it's actually we're still in that the carry on from that that it's been dropped but of course the reason for weighing women has changed and it's about helping give women some feedback about what a healthy weight gain might look like. Great okay I think we're going to leave it there <laughs> otherwise we I mean we could really just talk endlessly about this there's so much to um, pick up on but um, uh, I just wanted to thank both Paul and Karen today because I think it's just been a fantastic hangout. I normally try and sum up at the end <laughs> what we've talked about, but I really will struggle except to say that I think um, we've understood from the conversation that obesity is a very serious is issue and the magnitude of it we've talked about today, but on equally so, it's a sensitive issue and we've talked about problems there with um, parents and healthcare professionals and, and pregnant women as well. and. Paul and Karen both have different experiences uh, in early years and, and as children get older, but they're very complementary and can learn a lot from each other. And we obviously need to swap you over, and Paul needs to come and visit us here, and Karen needs to go and <laughs> visit Paul over there in, in Leeds. Sounds um, good. <laughs> um, you need to go when it's summer, though, Karen. I think you'll have to wait yeah. for the next hour. <laughs> you just don't want to come right now because it's, um, we've got our jumpers on here. Um, but yeah, I, I think I'd just like to say thank you very much. And I, I guess one fi I'd like one final thought from you both, just before we say bye. Just to, I just want to get a sense from both of you whether you're um, optimistic or, or not for the future in terms of childhood obesity. And, and are, are you, have you got a sense that things are improvement and we're getting some traction? Or, or, you're, or are you um, frustrated through the lack of change? So I'll, maybe I'll throw that to Paul first. And Paul, you have literally like 20 seconds to answer that, and the same for Karen. <laughs> so so my, my view of that would be, I think times continue to change, but not at the rate necessary. And I think there is, there is not yet the political will uh, necessary to change what is arguably one of the biggest public health issues. And when that public will comes, public health will comes, then I think we'll start really motoring. Okay, Karen. Yeah. And, and look, and I would concur with that. I think um, we're we're really very close to the tipping point where the consequences of this rate, these rates of obesity, are unsustainable and and immoral. And there's some really hard decisions that need to be made by government around policy, whether it's uh, around funding um, and resources for health services, or whether it's about policy. Um, influencing the food supply. Um, but I, I, I do believe those things are well on the way and there will there, there is a shift happening. And I, I think the US is providing some really nice examples of that as well. So I'm optimistic. Good. Phew. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, well, um, once again, thank you very much. Um, and thanks to everyone that's joined us on Twitter. I've seen out of the corner of my eye lots of tweets going on and people really getting engaged, which is really nice to see. Um, the Hangout video will stay on the website afterwards, so um, we won't be watching ourselves back, I'm sure, because we just cringe. <laughs> but it will be there for anyone that's missed it. Um, uh, and so thanks again, and just keep an eye out for our next Hangout. I don't know what it will be on yet, but you know, send through any ideas that you've got and uh, we'll do our best to accommodate them. So thank you very much and bye for now. Thank you. Thank you.